Hi Church, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time actually since I have shared with you all as I have been taking some months off of ministry and um, there's a number of reasons for that but um, our beautiful God as always in his graciousness um, has been healing and restoring my spirit during these past few months of just rest um, and so I want to share with you this morning um, a message that draws on part of that journey I guess and my prayer for you this morning is that the Holy Spirit would um, minister to you and potentially bring healing to you um, in an area of your life so I just want to share authentically as I always do I want to share authentically with you this morning part of um, the healing and restoration that God's done in my life over the past few months so Wayne and I are now going into our eighth year of pastoring Grace Church and as part of that role, um, we have always tried to keep a soft heart toward people. Um, we know that's important because our beautiful Abba has a soft heart towards people. So it's important for us as pastors to remember that we are shepherding his people and we must keep our hearts soft. And um, that's good. That's an important thing. But what that means is that over our pastoring journey, our hearts have received quite a lot of bumps and bruises along the way as people come and go. People's expectations are different and um, misunderstandings occur. And so every one of those bumps and bruises in, within that sort of seven years going into our eight years has affected Wayne and I emotionally. And um, we genuinely want to see people's lives transformed. So we, we go back um, to God when those bumps and bruises happen and we process them with God. And then we're able to remain on track with the kingdom purposes that is called us to. But about three years ago, a close relationship of ours ended abruptly and painfully. And I don't want to go into the detailed church, but it really wounded us. And today I'm not going to speak on behalf of Wayne. I'm going to share my personal journey. But um, for me personally, I have genuinely struggled with the hurt over it. And I've not been able to shake my woundedness. In fact, it's actually kept me um, really bound church. And so for the past three years, no matter how many times I processed it, um, how many times I prayed through with God with it and um, cried over it, I couldn't get to the root of it all. And I couldn't get free of the hurt or even really get an understanding of what happened. Um, so now usually for me, as I said, when that happens, I go to God, I sit in his presence and I get a kingdom perspective on things. I, I get a truth from him. He fixes it. I get a truth from him. I hold on to it and then we can move forward. Um, but this one particular hurt really rocked my foundation. And to be honest, church, the enemy did a major number on me. And I know personally that in my spirit that I would never get to that point of walking away from beautiful Abba because um, I've established my life on the word of God, on his truth. But I just couldn't get free of this wound, this hurt in my life. And I then found myself um, retreating from him um, and I found other things to occupy my time with instead of spending it in his presence. But what I've learned over the years is that God in his graciousness will allow us space to get it all together. And so I've taken that time off just to get it together, church. Um, and God does that because he has given us all a free will. And I love that about him. And what I also love about him is that he is gentle and patient with us. Um, and that always comes at a season, in a seasonal time. He's gentle and patient, patient with us, church. Um, but I also know from experience that there will come a point when God will speak a word of correction. And it's not to discipline necessarily, but it's just to snap us out of the quagmire that we kind of find ourselves in. And so that's what happened to me a few months ago when the Holy Spirit spoke these words, stop hiding like Jonah. So, okay, God got my attention. Um, so today we're going to be delving into the book 
of Jonah. Just a little bit. And I have so much to share with you, church, that I will um, expand on that in another message where we can dig right into um, some of the Hebrew and and meanings of things and um, themes and types. But today I just want to stick to mainly the main points that God's been teaching me over this past few months. So Jonah isn't a book that I have ever shared a message on or even really taken time to read regularly. Um, I don't know about you, but it's kind of a story that you know. And so I haven't really looked at it in terms of what an, a, an, a treasure or a mystery or whatever God wanted me to um, find that he often unveils in his words. So I kind of knew that story and hadn't really thought about it, hadn't really read it regularly. So when God corrected me and told me to stop hiding like Jonah, I was actually very interested to find out what that would mean. Um, So let's begin, church. So the book of Jonah is found in the Old Testament and is quite a short book made up of only four chapters. And um, in Hebrew, the number four is the letter Dalet, um, which has the pictogram of the door. We've spoken before, church, about um, how, how each Hebrew letter has a picture attached to it. So the number four is the letter Dalet, And it has the pictogram of a door. In the New Testament, we read in John 10 verse 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And we know as believers that um, this scripture is referring to the biblical truth that there is only one way to a right relationship with God. Um, We are saved through Jesus alone. He is the door. He is the entryway um, to a right relationship with God. And so for a moment, I want you just to picture a door in your mind. Um, If you need to close your eyes, church, that's okay. (laughs) Just picture a door in your mind. So a closed door in its very nature is a barrier. It can stop us from physically moving into another area. Can you see that door, church? It's closed. Um, It's a barrier stopping us from moving into that next space. But then, on the other hand, an open door can also be an entryway. It grants us access into that other area. So when we walk through the door, we leave one space and we enter another space. And so the book of Jonah has more to tell us about salvation because we know that Jesus is the door, the entryway into salvation. He is our salvation. He is the door. And so when we we look at the um, book of Jonah with its four chapters, God's telling us already that there's something more to this book than what meets the eye, just that general story that we know about Jonah and the whale. And so... um, It has more to tell us about salvation. And at first we don't realize that. So in salvation, we move through a door. We move from a place of eternal death into eternal life. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we move through the entryway of Jesus and into God's kingdom. So like that that open door, we move from one space eternal death through Jesus the door and into eternal life. We move from one space into the other. But we also move from the old covenant of the law through Jesus and into the new covenant of grace. And the book of Jonah is all about these two covenants and it reflects the Father's heart for the redemption of humanity. Jonah 1, let's get into it. Jonah 1, verse 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish, to flee from the Lord. So Jonah was a prophet and he was called by God to deliver a message of salvation to the people of Nineveh. Now the people of Nineveh were Assyrians, a people, um, a group of people descended from Noah's son Shem, 
but who had long ago forsaken God and um, was was now at the point where they were pagans, where they were worshipping other gods. And so this put the Ninevites into the category of Gentiles, even though they descended from um, the Israelite people through Noah and Shem. Now, because they had turned away and forsaken God and were worshipping other, um, other gods, um, this had happened over a long period of history. They were now put into that, that category, like you and I, as Gentiles. And for Jonah, this task from God was an abhorrent call on his prophetic ministry. Because in Jonah's mind, Jonah being an Israelite, um, only the Israelites were God's chosen people. And so they were the only ones deserving of God's forgiveness and God's mercy. So Jonah ran away. Now, the interesting thing about that, as we know, you cannot run away from God. <laughs> Running away from God is impossible because he is omnipresent. He is in everything um, and he is ev everywhere. So Jonah's response to God's call is kind of funny and seems a little bit ridiculous really. But Jonah is not alone when it comes to hiding. In fact, there are many examples in the Bible where people hid from God. And I'm sure you can think of them right now. Um, there are plenty of people that hid from the calling of God or hid from God for many different reasons. And the first example that we read about people hiding from God comes from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament when Adam and Eve hid from God because of sin, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden. So hiding from God is definitely not something new. People hide from God from all kinds, for all kinds of reasons. Fear self-righteous um, self -righteous attitudes, anger towards God, hurts in their life, shame or pride. For me, I was hiding from God because of woundedness and I guess a fear of being hurt again in the future. And maybe this is something um, that you can relate to in the past or something that maybe you're struggling with right now, that you're hiding from God instead of running to God. For Jonah, though, I believe it was more about being self-righteous. He had a legalistic attitude in his thought life and he didn't want to share God's message of salvation with the Ninevites because in Jonah's eyes, they were Gentile sinners and they didn't deserve forgiveness. Jonah lived under the law where the punishment for sin was death. And here were these Gentile sinners about to receive God's mercy. But in Jonah's eyes, in his legalistic thinking, they deserved what the law required, which was death. And so the Ninevites deserved death, not mercy from God. This is how Jonah was thinking. So he ran away from God and what God was calling him to do. So what Jonah did was he begrudged the mercy of God. He didn't want God to show mercy to the heathens in Nineveh. Under the law, we judge others as unworthy. The law compels us to strive towards justice to be served. And because the Ninevites were Gentiles and sinners and worshipping other gods, that's exactly what Jonah thought they, they were um, needed. They needed that. Justice had to be served and they needed to be punished. So that's under the law. But today, under the new covenant of grace, we need to recognize that we are all equal to receive God's mercy. Jonah didn't understand that at the time. Not one person under grace, not one person deserves any good thing. Yet our beautiful Abba gifts us with his forgiveness and mercy. Church, I want you to get a hold of this concept. Under grace, you are gifted with Abba's beautiful gift of forgiveness and mercy. We don't deserve it but he, he lavishes it on us anyway. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Church, in this last day season that we find ourselves in, 
Do not begrudge the mercy of God towards other people in our nation. Do not hide from the message of God for our community, our neighbours and our families. God's heart for people still remains the same. His beautiful heart of forgiveness and mercy is still the same. We read in Jonah chapter 2 as we continue a prayer that Jonah prays to God as he sits in the belly of a whale. Although Jonah was unable to offer mercy to the Ninevites, our gracious God actually offered Jonah mercy as he sat in the belly of the whale. Even though Jonah had been disobedient and run away, God was merciful and offered Jonah mercy. Jonah couldn't give mercy, but God offered his mercy anyway. Jonah received God's mercy before he could then bring the message of God's mercy to the people. Church, that is us. We have received God's mercy. His forgiveness, his heart lives in us. And so let us recognize that as believers, we are the benefactors of God's mercy every day. So in turn, we need to extend mercy to those around us. Don't get caught up in the rhetoric of what's going on in our nation at the moment. Church, extend God's mercy to our neighbours in our community. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Before we went into lockdown and not long after God corrected me for hiding like Jonah, um, I organised a catch up with Diari and Aru, uh, a play date at my house with Cohen. And we were sharing stories about our times working in the mission field. So both of us had ministry in that area and in different countries though. And so I had been sharing uh, one of the wildest stories with her about some, um, some of the, the things that happened in Vanuatu and our life there and how Wayne and I had had to make a stand for God and um, in a pretty physically threatening situation. Um, one particular story, the story that I'm going to share really quickly with you now, is that we were, we were in a school building in a local area, a local village, and um, inside sharing devotions with teachers, and the building was surrounded by machete-wielding locals who weren't happy um, with God's, uh, God's school in the middle of their community. And so... Um, we had to make a stand. And as I was sharing, it's, it's a story for another day, but as I was sharing with Diari this story, she kind of became wide-eyed and a bit shocked. And I laughed it off because um, that's just who I was. And I laughed it off and I said, um, yes, back then I was fearless. And as the words came out of my mouth, church, um, it was kind of like, an arrow piercing my heart as the Holy Spirit began to connect the dots in what he had been telling me. You're hiding like Jonah and you used to be fearless. And as it, as I said, as it kind of those words left my mouth, it was a revelation the Holy Spirit just pierced my heart with. Yes, that's who I have always been. I have been fearless in God and I know who God says he is. I know the truth of that. And I have never backed down from the truth, the word of God. Um, but somewhere, I don't know where, but somewhere along the way, the enemy deceived me. And because of my woundedness over this hurt that happened about three years ago, um, this woundedness has been keeping me fearful and hiding like Jonah, retreating from God. Um, so God wanted me to realize he connected the dots for me that Jackie, you are fearless. You are fearless because I am your God and you are my child. And so church, moving forward now in the season that we are in, in this last day season, I am going to be fearless again. Fearless in the truth and stand for what God says. So let's head back to Jonah for a minute. So Jonah's mission to the Ninevites was to foreshadow the history of Christ to come. It's a prophetic pattern, and I don't have time, as I said, to go into all the detail, but I am going to share another message on it. 
It's a prophetic pattern that we read again um, in the New Testament with God um, when he continues his plan for redemption for humankind. Um, He wants to redeem Jew and Gentile into the kingdom of God. And Jonah didn't understand that, but God was showing and setting a pattern, a precedence, a foreshadowing of what was to come as Christ came to to, uh, bring reconciliation to Jew and Gentile into the kingdom of God. So Jonah was a prophet. He spoke the word of God, but he hid from his calling. Jonah made a mistake. He didn't trust that God was in control of a bigger plan, one much bigger than the small part that Jonah was to play. So church, right now, we are in a bigger plan of God. And I know that life at the moment can feel really overwhelming and maybe you're feeling really fearful, but I want to encourage you to keep trusting that God is in control of a much bigger plan. And as believers, it's a plan that we know the end to because the word of God tells us. Luke 21, verse 25 to 28. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among the nations. Bewildered by the roaring of the sea and the surging of the waves. Men will faint from fear and anxiety over what is coming upon the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Beautiful child of God, like me, it is time to stop hiding like Jonah and stand up, lift up our heads and be fearless in our walk with God. I want to encourage you to keep listening to his voice only because his grace is sufficient for you today.